welcome. It is my opinion, it is my fundamental belief, I should say, that education properly administered is about that conversion, as you can predict. Uh, I don't think that that is how education is administered very often. How to present the truth, of course. Well, through beauty and through art. The great beauty clothed. Yes, there is a second version of this painting. More to come in a moment. Let's, let's begin maybe with, uh, with, a, with a quote. We live in a world that is obsessed with utility. Would you agree? Everything is measured. Everything is quantified. Um, you know, we live in a world that is organized around money, of course. And uh, we normally attribute value to the useful. So the useless seems to have less and less of a place, frankly, almost no place in our contemporary world. Why bother if it's useless? What Oscar Wilde is suggesting is that it is precisely in the uselessness of art that we find the master key that opens the door to transcendent, that is to say immaterial, as you suggest, meaning. We will think of a mathematical truth. How does a mathematical truth exist? Where does it exist? Our world is organized around math, is it not? And yet, this world of math is not fully tangible. In its highest expression, it's a transcendent thing. Are you with me? Still, this is abstract. Please stay with me. So we pay a high price for living in a world obsessed with utility, a world that has stopped taking beauty seriously. Today's version of beauty barely contains, if at all, any form of the transcendent. In other words, beauty has become an object. The subject has become an object, which is a problem. There's things from the past that we have to remember that are part of us. And I think one of the most important things that we have neglected and effectively allowed to be destroyed is beauty. And we pay a very high price for that. You pay it every single day in how you see women in our society, for example. When you look at a woman, you don't see the master key to the transcendent, to the ideal of beauty. You see an object, right? That's the thing to excise and throw away. If you attune yourself to beauty, the transcendent is everywhere. Stepping back, when we look at a piece of art and we ask ourselves, why bother? There's at least three answers that come to mind. The first two you'll recognize immediately. The third is where things get very interesting and where our program really engages. So the first reason to engage any work of art is because it, it seems to have a kind of value. The value is a value in and of itself. Art starts with feeling. The first thing that you engage when you observe a work of art, when you express an aesthetic judgment, uh, the first thing is, is feeling. The second reason, of course, uh, familiar to our world, on the marketplace, if you had the original Brandon, you'd be sitting on some nice bank. It's like buying any other, uh, like a stock or a bond. Uh, you expect a return on your investment. But if you ask the average person, what do you think of this? Is this good? Immediately they'll say, yes, of course, because they want to look cultured. But if you press them and you ask, why is this good? Uh, well, frankly, they have no answer for you. In other words, there's no justification for the goodness of this work of art in our contemporary world because we don't think about it. This is a painting, of course, that's about love and beauty. The third 
and most important component of why we should engage with a work of art. To think, in other words, what is love? What is beauty? Should we trust beauty? Should we trust love? Is this true love? Right? And engaging these questions has nothing to do with the monetary value of the painting, nor, frankly, of how pleasurable it may be to look at. What you're doing is you're now moving in the direction of the kinds of questions from which we glean uh, the most meaning as human beings. So to go beyond a collection of facts is to ask the kinds of questions um, that help us to uncover the things that make us human. Uh, at this point, you might be a little bit um, put off by beauty. Why I say that is because beauty seems to be a very uh, high culture, complicated thing. Let's put it down to the most tangible level. Junchao, when you make uh, a cup of coffee for your mother in the morning and it's just the way she likes it, I would call that beautiful. And let me explain what I mean by beauty. So it doesn't have to be Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. It can be simply the harmony <laughs> of actualizing something and having that something be appreciated in the world. To recognize beauty in day-to-day -day life is something that I don't think uh, we do enough of. And I think we have everything to gain from if we start doing it. Uh, let me give you another example if coffee doesn't work for you. Uh, I dressed myself this morning, and you might think nothing of it, which is probably the case. But uh, for a person with uh, a taste for beauty, I've made some kind of an effort. I've put some sort of time into this, not a whole lot of, of time, but some time into putting this little thing together. We have a, a blazer, we have a shirt, we have pants, we have shoes that you can't see, of course. We have a watch. And you may notice that there's black, and there's gray, and there's white, and this is white, and this is black, and this is kind of gray, and my shoes are black, and it all sort of fits. My point is that we live our lives creating harmony, whether it's making a cup of coffee for your mother, dressing yourself a certain way. Uh, you don't need to look at Botticelli's Venus in order to have a taste for the beautiful, a desire for harmony. Let me help you with the story. Venus, as we know, is the goddess of erotic love. And what's most important to remember, students, is that Botticelli is a Platonist. For Plato and for Botticelli, Beauty and the experience of the beautiful starts with sexual desire. Another way of saying that, the birth of Venus is the beginning of beauty. The experience of the beautiful starts with a physical attraction. But immediately we see that Botticelli adds gestures. When we look closer at Venus and we look at her face, what we see is an expression, an expression of beauty itself. Beauty, says Botticelli, through his work of art, referencing, of course, the great Plato, is a visitor from another world. Venus gazes at you from a place beyond the material, a place where true beauty resides. She sees us and invites us, the audience, the art observer, to meet her, to bond with her, to unite with her in the context of true beauty itself. We know that Botticelli was inspired by his muse, Simonetta Vespucci, a living, breathing human being 
who was also completely unobtainable. Uh, Miss Vespucci, of course, was um, connected to the ruling class in a way that would preclude the possibility of Botticelli ever being able to actualize this love. <laughs> so he is already painting a unobtainable creature. Simonetta Vespucci passes away prematurely, and Botticelli, as a gesture of devotion to her and to what she showed him, what this muse opened the door to, uh, he vows to be buried at her feet for eternity. This woman, this unobtainable creature, this manifestation of otherworldly transcendent beauty, although she is unmistakably attractive, properly understood, she is the master key that opens the door to transcendent beauty. Of course, Simonetta Vespucci's physical form, like everyone's physical form, decays over time, right? However, this work of art does not. Although it may start with erotic love, physical attraction, next time you feel it, think about the birth of Venus. It starts with this, always. When you feel it, what you're feeling is beauty. Beauty is speaking to you. But you have to get past your factual story, Jun Chao, of the chemicals that are inside of you. That's not what this is about. Those chemicals are an invitation to think about something, to consider beauty itself. When you look at her face and you get lost in her face, and if you've ever been lost in the eyes of a woman, this should be familiar to you. You don't see her, you see beyond her. And you unite with her in an immaterial place, if that makes sense. I'm sure you've had some kind of a version of this experience where you've lost yourself in someone. Have you had this experience before? When you lose yourself in her, where are you? Like time stops. Have you had this experience? Time like slows down and stops. The, like it feels like the whole world is, you know, doing whatever the hell it's doing, and then there's you and her. So if you've had that experience, you're starting to touch a transcendent thing. Okay? Something that's not really based in a material reality. And it's a place where you unite with beauty itself. If you're following what I'm saying, it starts with a feeling. Right? Think about it. And then it migrates into this other thing, this reason-based activity. That's what we're doing now, by the way. So it's beauty is an invitation to enter the world of the spiritual for Botticelli. Our society, which has forgotten beauty and this version of beauty, is a society that's organized merely in the object, not the spiritual, transcendent, immaterial domain of beauty, but the objectified version of beauty. We pay a very high price for forgetting beauty and for not taking beauty seriously. And the price we pay is in this transactional sort of reality where everyone objectifies everyone else. That's the price that we pay for not taking beauty seriously. When you look at this painting, this is the invitation toward the transcendent, the immaterial, not the chemicals, not the fact that we're a product of nature. Of course we are. Yes, that's nice. But that's not really the point of this painting. The point of this painting <laughs> is to connect to this other domain, which is where meaning comes from. Why do you live your life if not for love? What's the point of, of living this life if you've never felt true love? What is true love? Is this true love? I'm not sure. <laughs> More on that in a moment. 
uh, as we said in the context of our discussion of beauty last week, the thing with beauty, it's fleeting, it's delicate, it's fragile, it's also very seductive. There's an inherent challenge which is presented by your own experience of beauty. Oftentimes beauty disappoints, beauty leads you astray, beauty betrays. You think you're with the goddess, you are not with the goddess. You think you're with the lioness, I'm using some of the my vocabulary, uh, but you are not with the lioness. You're with something that you thought was that, but it isn't. Now comes the question, should you trust beauty when she can betray you an important question that artists have asked for many many years as i hope you started to feel a little bit and i use that word intentionally um, truth is an enjoyable pleasurable beautiful feeling if a professor wins your mind but not your heart it's not going to go. That's not a true conversion. A conversion to truth means that you are, you are ready to commit your mind, your body, and your soul to truth. That's what thinking is about. Yeah? It's the quest for the truth. But unless you feel it in your bones, this is not going to work. And there's very few people that walk out of a university being converted to truth. What they're converted to is self-interest, which didn't take much effort, by the way, because they're biologically disposed to maximize that interest. But we're also capable of something more than self-interest. We're capable of the transcendent, the selfless, the common good. And by the way, that's where the meaning is.